This is a video on Act 3 of Measure for Measure with some speech analysis and stuff like that. It follows on from another two and hopefully there are two more that will come after it. It goes with Ella 2 examination with AQA for AS level. Act 3 begins with Claudio talking to the Friar Duke in the prison about his impending death. And we see Claudio's pessimism through his use of a binary pair with quite a lot of compound there because it's the hope for living and then the prepared to die. So essentially, he really does want to live, but then he's accepted the fact that he's probably going to die. The Duke then uses a series of imperatives to show his religious power. He says, like, be absolute for death. It's very forceful. It's He's sort of almost giving a sermon as a spiritual advisor. It could be deemed to be part of his disguise. He's trying to alter his language so that he doesn't get, you know, his identity doesn't get revealed. And then the Fry Duke uses a whole series of sermonising arguments, all that start with, like, for thou, and then go on and on and on. Here are a few examples here. The general tone of the arguments he's giving is, you know, just be prepared to die. You like sleep and you hate death, they're the same thing. You're not brave because you're afraid of death. You're running away from death, but surely running away from death is the same as running towards death, that sort of thing. And you can see from the length of his monologue here, I mean, in my book it's over a page in length, this monologue, he has got all the power in the conversation due to his religious status. And if you look at the monologue, the whole thing is filled with enjoyment, which you could say mimics the structure of life. You could say that slim similarity between the Duke when he's being the Duke himself or Friar Duke is that he's ambiguous in both times. So when he was giving his speech at the beginning, he was being quite ambiguous. And now he's being ambiguous for using similes. So like an ass who's back with Ingot's bow. He's not just saying it how it is, he's using a lot of words to put a few very simple arguments down. He also uses lists, which emphasises his points. When th thou art old and rich, thou hast neither heat, affection, limb, nor beauty. It emphasises all the words in the list, and essentially tells the audience and Claudio that they can't enjoy old age because they're old. So you may as well die now whilst you're young, because when you're old you're not going to be able to enjoy life anyway. And she also makes the audience question their own ideas about life through the use of a rhetorical question. What's yet in this that bears the name of life? Obviously, I can't put all of the dramatic techniques down in this PowerPoint, so I've put a few down, but if I'm going through the text whilst I'm watching this, I'll say any few that I find that really stick out. And I always find rhetorical questions to be a really good thing to write about as a dramatic technique, because it really makes the audience feel involved, draws them into the play and stuff like that. And now Isabella enters the building, which... It builds up dramatic technique, I suppose, because the audience are aware of what she's going to say, whereas the characters on the stage don't, so the audience have got a greater knowledge than the characters. The audience might start thinking about how Claudio is going to react to this, because Claudio's just been told, you know, be prepared to die, and he's just humoured the friar by saying, you know, I suit to live, I find I seek to die. But when Isabella comes in tells me he could live if he allows her to submit to rape, maybe there's going to be a change in Claudio, so the audience might start thinking about that. And then we get dramatic irony occurring because the Fry Duke wants to spy on the conversation. You know, he says, bring me to hear them speak where I may be concealed. This could be deemed to be like a small sort of line which symbolises the whole play. Because in the whole play he's hearing all of the people of Vienna speak whilst being concealed through his disguise. It could also be used to show the extent of the corruption in Vienna. Even the good people who are meant to be doing the right thing and keeping everything together are being deceitful. They're lying, they're spying on things. Then we've got our conversation between Isabella and Claudio. It's important to remember they are brother and sister, even though I do think the language, particularly in here, beyond, like, sister and stuff, really shows that depth of their relationship. Maybe it's just how society was at the time, but that's just my opinion. They take turn using adjacency pairs to make the conversation seem more realistic, so Claudio uses a question to initiate the conversation, you know. He's saying, now, sister, what's the comfort? He's asking her for good news. And Isabella actually gives a dispreferred response for black comedic effect. She says... You know, as all comforts are good, you know, most good indeed. She's saying, you know, there's good comfort. So it's the illusion of, preferred, of a preferred response. So it's quite a subverted idea. So Claudia might think, you know, oh, I'm going to live, I'm going to survive. And then he, Isabella's like, Lord Angelo intends you for his swift ambassador. So that's a black comic effect, I suppose, which goes in with the whole play. Cause the whole play's got the idea of black comedy. That's its, one of its principal genres. We could see now a change in Claudio's character. Claudio says, is there no remedy? Whereas just, you know, a few lines earlier, he says to the Friar Duke, um, I find I seek to die. And now he's saying, you know, is there any way I can survive? You know, we could be seeing that he's insincere earlier and he just really wants to live and he was just lying to the Friar Duke. So that could be a 
interesting point you can make about Claudio's character if he comes up, which I'm not sure the likelihood of him coming up, to be honest, he's not the most exciting of characters. You could also look at some of the Lexus she uses here, so we've got our prisons and incarceration Lexus, and then our Lexus of sexual nature, and you could delve into quotes, if you've got a quote there for another purpose. You might be able to look into it and think, you know, why is she using this Lexus to have prisons and incarceration? Why is she using Lexus of sexual nature? Maybe she's trying to start hinting to Claudio about the whole idea of what Angelo's asked her to do without being really explicit. Cause maybe she's ashamed. She uses quite a lot of delaying tactics if you read through it. And as you can see through the passage, Isabella keeps pushing Claudio until he says what she wants him to say. So, you know, for a bit she doubts Claudio, says, you know, I, I fear you, Claudio, and I quake, you know, she's afraid he'd rather live longer than die with honour. But eventually, you know, he says, you know, if I must die, I will encounter darkness as a bride. Obviously, the idea of a bride is quite ironic, because bride tends to be associated with purity, virginity, and obviously Claudio is only here because he's had sex. We can look at how Isabella's speech has got negative connotations, all of her words, you know, deep as hell, stuff like that, obviously negative religious connotations, maybe she's reminding him about her morality and stuff like that. We could say it's building up tension towards the like dramatic statement of this whole scene, which is when Isabella tells Claudio, you know, if I would yield Angelo my virginity, thou must be freed. It makes quite a change from her ambiguity earlier. She's just saying it in very simple words. Maybe she wants him to understand exactly what's happening and she thinks that if she uses simple words, they'll be more powerful, they'll hit him harder and he will exactly respect what would happen. And then we have Claudio who, you know, he comes back, he's exclaiming, oh heavens, it cannot be. Now this could be ambiguous because it could mean, oh my gosh, that's terrible, you can't let him rape you. Or it could mean, oh my god, just have sex with him and then I'll survive. As an audience, we're not entirely sure of what he actually means at this point. We can guess, but we cannot know. So this builds up tension because the audience, you know, he's waiting to find out what Claudio actually means. We're all there, we're on the edge of our seats and stuff like that. And Isabella also helps to add to the tension, you know, saying your death tomorrow. Why she does this, I've got no idea. We suppose she's got the power to move men, but surely if you're trying to persuade someone to, you know, say, let Angelo just kill me, you wouldn't try to remind them of the fact that they're going to lose their life for that. I mean, it just seems a bit stupid. But maybe you could comment on how unlikely this utterance would be in... And then, say, you know, Shakespeare's put it in for the audience's sake rather than the character's sake. He's put it in to build the tension really high with the audience, to make the audience, you know, want to keep watching, rather than to make the speech realistic. And then we see Claudio here, you know, he's starting to fear death. You can see his building up of fear with his repetition of infinitive verbs. If you read through it, they're all to do with pathetic fallacy they're all to do with weather and nature and stuff like that so we've got our cold obstruction we've got fiery fiery floods we've got thick ribbed ice viewless winds stuff like that and it just goes down and he's basically saying you know i h hate the idea of death i'm terrified of it so it builds up a lot of tension because it's quite a long monologue here the audience is thinking oh my god what's he going to say is he going to ask isabella to let him live and of course she does he says sweet sister let me live we've got our alliteration here emphasizes all of the words stresses it you know he's saying sweet sister you know it emphasizes both sweet and sister he's saying you know we are related please save me and then we have this massive outburst from isabella you know she's just such strong adjectives you know so we don't just have, you know, nouns, beast, coward and wretch, we've also got adjectives describing them, it increases the impact they have on the audience. We've got a faithless coward, a dishonest wretch. I say the adjectives emphasise the nouns themselves. Then Isabella uses rhetorical questions to test Claudio's and the audience's moral compass. She's saying, wilt thou be made a man out of my vice? So not only does Claudio think about this, but the whole audience is thinking what's the right thing to do here, it makes the audience feel really involved. I think rhetorical questions are used quite a lot by Isabella because maybe she's realised the power they have to move men. Then we have Isabella and she says, fie, 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 it means shame, shame, shame. And if you remember back to Angelo's soliloquy earlier when he's saying, you know, I want to have sex with Isabella, you know, he's talking about his lust for her, he uses those three words as well. This could just be Shakespeare's, you know, general pattern of speech and that Shakespeare says a lot or whoever even wrote this play because... I bet it wasn't even Shakespeare after all. But um, it could be deemed to be a holding the plot together as well. You could say, you know, Shakespeare's trying to make the plot sort of weave together rather than having lots of different scenes. I mean, we've got quite a few different plots running through this play. 
and you could say that it's trying to reflect Angelo's speech, it's trying to hold the whole play together. And then we see Isabella being a bit rebellious here and violating Grice's maxim of politeness. So she isn't being polite, she's saying, you know, it's best that you die tomorrow, really. And I would say this is actually a really important quote. If you can learn this quote, I think it's a really good one because it shows that Isabella values her morality and religious beliefs over her family. And then Friar Duke comes back in and we know that he's been listening in. And he's he actually quite condescending to... Um, Claudio, he says, you know, son. He's describing him, son. He's saying, you know, look, I'm more powerful than you. And he lies. He's like, I am confessor to Angelo. I know this to be true. I mean, no, he is not. But this builds up dramatic tension because the audience knows this is a load of rubbish. Whereas um, Claudio is thinking, hmm. And Claudio lapped up his every word. And maybe the Fry Duke is trying to make Claudio feel a bit better about the whole situation. And we can see here the Fry Duke has returned to speaking in prose rather than in iambic pentameter. Maybe he thinks this is going to make him sound more like a confessor or more like a duke than if he was being quite regal with his iambic pentameter. But I'm not really sure about that one, to be honest. And then we've got Claudio, who's being really incisive. It's just creating more and more dramatic tension. He's saying, I'm so out of love with the life that I will soon be rid of it. Well, just a second ago, he was begging for his life, so... It's confusing for the audience listening to this, but it's also quite dramatic, you know, what's Claudio thinking? The audience is totally unaware of what's going on in his head. And then we have Friar Duke fulfilling his role as the solution provider. He's meant to be the one that's restoring order in Vienna. So he provides a plan to Isabella and he tells her the story of Mariana. We could say that the Duke's revealing of this plan has come about because he, uh, Shakespeare wanted the audience to feel dramatic tension, maybe he wanted the audience to really want to know what was going to come next, he wanted them to be desperate to keep on watching, stuff like that. It also sets the scene for later parts of the play. Act 3, scene 2 comes in, this is on a street near the prison. It's probably been included for a bit of light humour, because it's got characters like Pompey and Lucio in. I'm pretty sure he's called Pompey rather than Pompey, I don't know why I decided to emphasize the A like that. Anyway, we have got the Friar Duke, he's being rather catechizing. This strengthens his disguise. He says, oh heavens, you know, that's a religious thing to say. Would you have said that when he was being dukey? Probably not. Then we have the Friar Duke who's showing his religious power through his use of imperatives. We've got things like, go mend, go mend. This is relatively plain and simple Lexis probably been used so that Pompey can understand what he's saying. Imperatives shows that his, you know, he's got religious power, he's got more power than Pompey. Also, he speaks in, uh, what's it called, iambic pentameter, whilst the other characters, Elbow particularly, and Pompey, they haven't got the sort of prestige to be able to speak in iambic pentameter, so we can see straight away the division socially between Friar Duke and Pompey. Then Lucio comes in, he's like, how, how, no noble Pompey, what at the wheels of Caesar? Obviously that's irony, because it's a reference to the name Pompey, which is a classical reference. And you can see here Lucio's got quite a long monologue because Pompey doesn't speak, because Pompey simply doesn't understand what he's saying. Pompey hasn't got that level of understanding of that, like, Lexus and stuff like that. And we can even, you know, Lucio even points this out. He's like, you know, what reply? You know, asks the question. Obviously, there's no reply because Pompey's got no idea what Lucio's on about. Lucio then converges to Pompey using covert prestige, you know, art going to prison Pompey, and that's something that Pompey can actually understand because it's in simple terms. So Pompey says, yes, yes, faith, sir. But Lucio, you know, says, you know, I'm not going to intervene, you know, farewell, simply due to the class division. He doesn't see any reason to save Pompey because he is so many classes above him, it might actually bring him down if he's seen to be helping out a board or whatever this Pompey person is. A pimp, I think that's what Pompey is. And even though Lucio doesn't help Pompey, Pompey is still respectful to Lucio. Maybe it's because he's trying to respect his positive face because he wants to get something from Lucio. Or maybe it's simply due to the power asymmetry and Pompey feels the need to respect Lucio. You know, he says things like, sir, and good worship. And then we have major, 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 major dramatic irony here with Lucio having a conversation with the Duke. It's quite a long conversation. It's a really good one to mention in essays because Lucio is talking to the Duke and he doesn't realise it's the Duke, he thinks he's talking to a friar, so he starts asking questions like, you know, what news, friar of the Duke, and then he says quite a lot of sexual stuff later on, we'll come through that as we look through the scene. 
he doesn't respect the fried duke's positive face particularly he doesn't really praise him because he doesn't a he doesn't want anything and b he does not realize it's the duke so he feels no need to try to respect this duke's positive face because he also as far as he's concerned it's just some random friar in this scene we can also see that lucio doesn't change his character depending on who he speaks to he just treats everybody exactly the same in terms of his way of speaking i suppose Lucio then describes Angelo, and I've put here these are very good quotes to learn, particularly because I think at some point in, hopefully it'll be this year, because I think Angelo will be a really nice character to write about, but at some point there will be a question on Angelo, and it'd be nice to have stuff written about Angelo from another character, you could just slip in, if you know, it'll look quite nice. So we've got, Angelo was not made by man and woman, his urine is congealed ice, and he is emotion and generative. So it's basically saying, Angelo isn't really human, he has no heart. He's essentially cold and lifeless. And then Lucio actually shows a twisted admiration for the Duke. And we could say this is quite funny because obviously Lucio is thinking, oh, this is brilliant, the Duke's such a lad. Whereas the Duke is thinking, sorry, there's some banging going on outside. Like, as in a build of banging. Like, I think they're building a bathroom or something. Might have to stop filming. Uh, I'm not even filming, I'm recording. Yeah, so Lucio's being really respectful. In a sense, he's not being respectful, he's... He's admiring the Duke for the Duke's sexual nature, or as the Duke's saying, you know, thinking in his head, think this is terrible. And then we get a bit of humour coming through through the uh, Fry Duke's denial of Lucio's stuff, because Fry Duke is subtly defending himself against Lucio's claims. There's just so much irony in this scene, because the, Lucio simply doesn't realise that the person he is talking to is the person he's essentially slagging off. And then we've got dramatic tension building up when the Lucio sort of slanders the Duke using a tripartite list that you can see there. Superficial, ignorant, unwaiting. And the, at the moment we're sitting there thinking, oh my god, Lucio, what are you doing? So much dramatic tension building up in this scene it makes it very exciting for the audience to watch. And then we have almost a converging of the Fry Duke's language as he comes back with a tripartite list to calling the Duke a scholar, a statesman and a soldier. And then if you look there, they all begin with S as well, so that is sibilance, I think. And then Lucio hits back at the Duke with this lengthy monologue, which is filled with lots of sexual metaphors, like filling a bottle with a tun dish. This is body humour. At the time, the audience would be in, you know, crying for laughter. They'd have found this absolutely hilarious. And then he's like, the Duke would eat mutton on Fridays. Obviously, that's a metaphor for sex or something. It's quite covert prestige, showing that Lucio is a really lower class. And it's also very, very disrespectful, because this isn't the sort of thing the Duke wants to be flying around the Vienna. And then the Duke's left alone on the stage, and he gives a rhyming soliloquy that convinces himself and the audience that he is moral. He's like, greatness and morality, whitest virtue. It's quite positive imagery, which is a great contrast to Lucio's negative imagery at the end of his monologue, where he's like... Um, he would mouth with a beggar though she smelt brown bread and garlic. So it's very negative imagery compared to very positive imagery. I suppose that's compar. And then we get the contrast of this Duke's, um, he's got a little soliloquy here, which is in I Am Open Tamata, and Overdon comes in and Overdon speaks in prose. She's of a much lower social status. And Overdon here, she's sort of begging for, I suppose, freedom. She's, she's being arrested, essentially, for running a brothel. And she's trying to fight, so she says stuff like, Good, my lord, be good to me. Your honour is accounted with a merciful man. Good, my lord. That's a repetition of good there. And good is obviously very high-frequency Lexis. She calls him my lord, your honour, merciful man, my lord. She's respecting his positive face simply because she wants to get something from him. She wants to be freed. She wants to be pardoned. Then we have Aeschylus coming in, and he uses figurative language to relate to Angelo. You know, my brother Angelo, my brother wrote my... Be my by my pity, God, bad reading there. Uh, at first, the first time I read this, I actually thought they were brothers, but it turned out it's actually figurative language, so it's not real. It's just the way they spoke about each other back in the day. And in the section, Aeschylus is also giving lots of orders, showing his instrumental power, simply due to his social status and because he's been put in a position of responsibility. Then we've got the provost chipping in here. He says. And the entertainment of death, and obviously entertainment and death, they're quite separate things. There could be black humour, I suppose, though I'm not really sure who would find that funny. It's compar, it's dramatic effect. And then Fry Duke comes in, he uses relatively elaborate syntax as part of his verbal disguise, so not only does he use lots of different 
religious techniques and lots of different uh, religious phrases like heaven and God and stuff. He also uses relatively elaborate syntax and to try to have a verbal disguise. And as the scene progresses, you can actually see Freiduke's speech type converge towards Aeschylus's. And if you, I mean, I can't read it to you, but if you watch, if you look at it and you read through it, the Duke goes from having iambic pentameter previously to having prose. Now he's speaking to Aeschylus. And then Freiduke's rather nosy and he asks Aeschylus, you know, of what disposition was the Duke. Freiduke wants to find out more about how people viewed him, but the audience is thinking, ooh, with his dramatic tension, we've just seen what happened with Lucio, is it going to be repeated by Aeschylus? Aeschylus is actually very praising of the Duke, and we were discussing this in class actually. Does Aeschylus know that he's speaking to the Duke? Has he seen through the Duke's disguise? And we don't know, because Shakespeare never makes it explicit. But the audience might be thinking that as they're watching, they're thinking, does Aeschylus know more than he's letting on? Aeschylus also tries to appear quite lordly, using rhetorical flourishes and other literary techniques. And then we've got quite a lot of law-related lexis, which makes the Freiduke appear knowledgeable, and it also reminds the audience of the main theme of the play, I mean, measure for measure. This play is about dispensing justice and bringing back equality within Vienna, it's restoring its moral compass and stuff like that. And then Aeschylus leaves and the Duke's by himself again, Friar Duke, and he returns to his former self, so he goes back to rhyming. So it rhymes, which is quite nice, it's quite cool actually. It's soliloquy, obviously, it's in iambic pentameter. It is very strong iambic pentameter actually, so it's quite pleasing to the ears, the audience. There's quite a lot of references in it to public and private selves, so, um, Oh, what many may man within him hide, though angel on the outward side. So he's essentially saying, although Angelo appears to be an angel, what is in him? He then talks to the audience and references what's going to happen, and there's reference here to the bed trick in the last few lines. So he's announcing the plan to the audience, which is building dramatic tension. The bed trick is essentially a biblical reference. It's used in quite a lot of plays at the time. But if you remember the story of Jacob and Esau, we saw... I can never pronounce these things. I remember reading this story ages ago. But my lack of biblical knowledge means I'll probably mess it up. But it's to do with Leah and Rachel later and they're marrying. It's dramatic irony. If you want to know more about it, just look up, probably type into the Bible. Type into the Bible? We can't really type into the Bible. Type into Google, just like Bible, Jacob, Esau, Leah, Rachel. That should be enough and you'll get the story up. Or just go read the Bible. But the Bible's quite long, so it might take quite a while to find. Woo, that's the end of Act 3. Hopefully I'll see you next time for Act 4. Have a lovely day and goodbye.